Welcome to this video on how radio telescopes receive power off the sky. In astronomy, we sometimes colloquially refer to our telescopes as photon buckets, for catching photons off of the sky. So I want to talk a little bit in the context of radio astronomy about how our photon buckets, in particular, collect energy off the sky and the different sets of units that we have for describing the signal that we receive through various stages of analysis. The radio telescopes are kind of unique in that we're used to getting the signal from a radio telescope electronically as an electrical signal over a wire. So here at the end of that wire, we have an electrical signal. How do we measure that? Well, your first impulse may be to grab your voltimeter and measure the number of volts. But it turns out if you connect, say, a voltimeter or an oscilloscope up to this output here, all you're going to see is a bunch of signal that looks like this. It's noise. And so when you're looking at noise, voltage isn't a great way of looking at it. Instead, we should probably be measuring the power that we get out. Power is energy per second, and we often use units like watts or ergs per second to characterize that. But let's go a little farther upstream here. I put a little box between us and the radio telescope here, which now colored in green. What if we have something like a filter or an amplifier here? Well, that's obviously going to affect how much signal we get out of the end of our wire. So let's talk about our amplifier first. How should we deal with that? Well, ultimately we're going to have to calibrate our radio telescope by looking up at some source up on the sky, like maybe a star, of a known brightness. And maybe using that star of a known brightness, we can figure out whatever gain there was associated with our amplifier. If there was some, some factor of g that was being multiplied by our signal, we should be able to, by normalizing our output to the star here, we should be able to remove the effect of that amplification. So we could talk about power after calibration. So we don't need to worry about our amplifier just yet. What about our filter here? That filter is going to have some bandwidth associated with it. It's going to let some range of frequencies through. And we need to deal with that somehow in what we measure. If we look at this this calibrator star up here with a bandwidth of 100 megahertz versus with a bandwidth of 200 megahertz, how is our signal amplitude going to change? One thing we might need to be doing here is to talk about how much power we're getting for a given bandwidth, so power per hertz. So this is one level removed from what we might just naively measure here at the end, but this is the kind of thing that you'll measure on a spectrometer. So this is energy per second per hertz, and on a spectrometer you might see it as units of, uh, say, like dBm per hertz, or we similarly might call this ergs per second per hertz. Now, I wanted to caution you right here, there's a seconds here, and there's a hertz, and we know hertz is like one over a second, so you might be tempted to cancel this out and, uh, and call these just ergs. I would say that those units are quite misleading. What we really mean here really are ergs per seconds per hertz, and we shouldn't be canceling out those units of seconds with hertz because it's losing the fact that we are normalizing by the bandwidth over which we've made our measurement. Okay, so we've removed or at least dealt with the fact that we may have had a gain or an amplification in our signal chain. We've dealt with the fact that, that we have a filter in our system that controls how what kind of a bandwidth comes out our signal at the end, but we haven't said anything yet about what our antenna here might be. So what is this antenna doing? Well, it's got some aperture here, some region over which it's collecting electromagnetic waves or photons, and we have photons that are coming here out of our star and falling in through our aperture and getting reflected up into the feed that eventually couples that signal out over an electrical wire that we measure our signal on. So there's a collecting area here. And obviously, the larger your collecting area, the more photons you're going to pick up. Therefore, the larger the signal you'll get from this star up here, right? So how are two different radio telescopes of different sizes ever going to agree on the brightness of this star? Well, you could take the amount of power that you get, and you could divide it by the area over which you've collected that signal. So just like we divided out the bandwidth to come up with a measurement that nominally doesn't depend on the frequency interval over which you measure it, we could similarly divide out by the collecting area of our telescope. And we get a power per area, and that's called a flux. So flux comes in units of, say, watts per meter squared, or we could write that as uh, ergs per second 
per centimeter squared. So flux is very useful. However, it doesn't really incorporate what we already were doing over here with, with normalizing by a bandwidth. So in combining these two different things, a flux and a power per frequency, we would like a power per area per hertz. And this is sometimes called a flux density. So units for flux density are sometimes like power per things like watts per meter squared per hertz, or we could write ergs per second per hertz per centimeter squared. But it turns out if you go and you make measurements on the sky, you're going to get very small numbers typically when you're observing some source on the sky. We'll end up with things like something of order 10 to the minus 26 over here, or maybe 10 to the minus 23 over here. So in honor of the very first radio astronomer, Carl Jansky, radio astronomers decided to define a unit called a Jansky. So Jansky is 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz in these units of meters, kilogram, seconds, or 10 to the minus 23 in CGS units, which are ergs per second per hertz per centimeter squared. So when you hear people talking about Janskys, they're talking about flux density. And Janskys are the first unit that most people with a radio telescope can agree on. This is how many photons per meter squared per hertz are coming from a radio source on the sky. So I'll say in parentheses here that most, and we'll talk about why it's only most, can't agree that Jansky's the source. Now why potentially might we not agree on this? Well suppose we have some region of sky up here and instead of having just one star up there as we've had before, let's put a big puffy nebula up here. So let's say we have this big puffy nebula up there and we observe it with a relatively small telescope over here and as we know the field of view of this telescope the angle across its beam on the sky, theta, is approximately the wavelength we're observing at divided by the diameter of that dish. So let's say we have a small dish out here, which means d is small, which means we've got a relatively large beam on the sky. So the beam from this green telescope encompasses almost the entire nebula here, which means that only emission that happens within this beam finds its way into this telescope which is to say that not all the photons that come from this nebula are going into this telescope here. Now let's suppose I go out and build a much larger telescope here. I'll call her this one blue. And let's say our blue telescope has a beam because it's larger, D is bigger, it means our beam on the sky is actually smaller. So suppose our larger telescope only sees this area of this nebula. Well now we have two competing effects that are a little complicated here. The blue telescope is bigger, so it collects more photons because for a given flux, this has more area and therefore collects more power. So the blue telescope collects more power because it has a bigger area. However, it had a smaller beam on the sky, which means that from the point of view of this larger telescope, this nebula is only the size of this blue circle. So less of the region on the sky is emitting photons into this telescope here, whereas for the green telescope, there's a larger region on the sky that is emitting photons that find its way into the signal from that telescope. So which wins out? Do you win by having more collecting area or a wider beam? Well, let's try to work this out. First thing you'll notice is that if we're measuring in Janskys, which is, you remember, power per area per hertz, that if we have a region P here that's emitting a patch, uh, let's say the green patch, will generate some number of photons per, per area per hertz. So you can imagine this green area has some number of Janskys associated with it, and then you collect that number of Janskys by the collecting area of the green telescope, and you end up with the power that the green telescope measures. And now realizing I should not have used the letter P here for a patch, I will use a different letter like omega. Now what about the blue telescope? Well, it has a smaller patch, omega blue, that it collects a signal over, and that's going to translate for a different number of Janskys, blue, which multiplied by the collecting area of the blue telescope will give us the power that the blue telescope measures. So the first thing you'll notice is because there's a larger patch on the sky that the green telescope sees, this number of Janskys up here is not going to equal this number of Janskys here. 
there will just be more photons per area per hertz if you consider a larger emitting patch on the sky. So these two telescopes, blue and green, will not be able to agree on the number of Janskys of this source. But here's the other funny thing. Because theta, which is the distance across this patch, goes as lambda over d, the area of this patch, which is kind of like theta squared, will go as lambda squared over d squared. And this also will go lambda squared over d squared for the blue telescope. Now the area is clearly related to the diameter by d squared, and for the blue telescope, it will also be the diameter of the blue telescope squared. So we end up with something that's proportional to lambda squared over d squared times d squared. So we'll actually find at the end of the day, this is really weird, we'll find that if your beam is completely contained inside of a source, that the power you measure on the green telescope is equal to the power you measure on the blue telescope. And that's very surprising. Another way you could say this that radio astronomers sometimes famously talk about is if you put your telescope inside of a large room that's all maintained at the same temperature, every direction you point there's the same emission coming in, then it doesn't matter how you design your telescope. Every telescope that you put in this large room will come out with the exact same power output. doesn't matter what the collecting area is, what the shape of it is, they will always measure the same power output. The only reason that telescopes don't measure the same power output is if they aren't looking at a big resolved patch on the sky, but instead looking at maybe a small point source out there. If there's a small point source, then the green beam will completely encompass that source, and the blue beam will completely encompass that source. So in this case, when there's a point source, not extended emission like this nebula here, but a point source, both the green and the blue telescope will be able to agree on the number of Janskys of that source, the flux density of that source, although they will both receive different amounts of power from it because they'll have different collecting areas. So we established that most telescopes, as long as they aren't resolving the source, resolving means that their beam is smaller than the source that they're looking at, as long as they're not resolving the source, most telescopes can agree on the number of Janskys of that source. So, so if unresolved, Janskys are, are your units of choice. Everybody can agree on the flux density of the source. If it is resolved, then what we'd like to do is we'd like to take our flux density and divide by the beam area, this omega. And if we divide by our beam area, then we can see that whichever telescope we're using, because we have the same power that we measure, we will divide by the collecting area to get our Janskys, but if we divide by the appropriate field of view, this is the angular area of that telescope, we'll have canceled out the added collecting area, and we'll again come back to a measure that everybody can agree on. And this is called specific intensity. And people often denote this with an I. So this is energy, it's divided by every possible unit you could imagine dividing by. It's divided by seconds, it's divided by hertz, it's divided by collecting area, it's divided by angular area, we'll call steradians, which is an angle squared. So for resolved sources, everybody can agree on the specific intensity of it. If you have an unresolved source, like a point source, then because everybody agreed on the number of Janskys, but we start dividing by different beam areas, not everybody will agree on the specific intensity from that source. You can only agree on the specific intensity if you have filled your whole beam on the sky with that source. So your beam has to be smaller than your source and then everybody can agree on the specific intensity. Now later on we'll talk about black bodies. And the reason I bring up these black body spectra is because the specific intensity of a black body emitter that is optically thick is determined by its temperature, which means in some sense we could use a temperature to describe our specific intensity if we wanted to. And at low frequencies, black body spectra kind of follow the formula 2kt over lambda squared. So if we say that 2kt, now I'm going to use a little b here to say that this is the brightness temperature over lambda squared is equal to I nu, we'll just define that, then Tb is a brightness temperature, which you could measure in units like Kelvin. And then you can use this formula right here, 
where k is Boltzmann's constant and lambda is the wavelength that you're observing at, you can equate the brightness temperature of something with the specific intensity that's coming from it. So doing this, you can measure the brightness temperature of anything on the sky. And it's not quite clear always whether the brightness temperature that you measure, Tb, is the actual thermal temperature of what you're looking at, or if what you're looking at is generated by non-thermal processes, it may be that, that there is no actual well-defined temperature of the object, but you can still define a brightness temperature. Radio dishes can make maps of the sky in brightness temperature, which is kind of a proxy for specific intensity. So to wrap up here and boil everything down, there are two main units that a radio astronomer uses to relate the measurements that are made on an electrical cable to what's actually coming in off the sky, these photons. One is these units of Janskys, and Janskys are very useful for point sources. So if you're making catalogs of, of discrete sources that are much smaller than your beam, you'll see them described in Janskys. If, on the other hand, you're making maps of extended emission on the sky where things are resolved, where whenever you point your telescope at it, you're only seeing a part of the whole thing, uh, then you'll want to use units of specific intensity, and radio astronomers often use brightness temperature here as a convenient way to describe the specific intensity of a region of sky. And brightness temperature sometimes corresponds to the thermal temperature of what you're looking at, whether it's the kinetic temperature or the electron excitation temperature, but sometimes it doesn't and it's just a convenient unit to carry around that describes locally how much energy is being picked up by your telescope per second, per unit of bandwidth, per collecting area, and per angular area of the beam on the sky. And the rest of these units, the power, the power per area, the power per hertz, are all units that you will use as you translate the intensity or the flux density of the sources on the sky to the electrical signals that finally come out the back end of these cables here. So when you make your actual measurements, you'll probably be measuring power or power per hertz. But then to relate that back to what you measured on the sky, you'll want to take out the effects of your instrument and that's where you'll eventually come back to units that everybody can agree on, which are Janskys and brightness temperature. Thanks for listening.